so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second in a series of webinars as part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers Project. Uh, this project from Kairos Canada is funded by the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program. My name is David Ivany. I am part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers team, and I'm honored to facilitate this webinar today. Also joining me from the Migrant Justice team at Kairos are Connie, Shannon, uh, Alfredo, uh, as well as uh, Father Peter Chalala, one of our partners in this project, who is going to be joining me in co-facilitating and moderating this session. Uh, we also welcome Dr. Shankar Nisathare, uh, Medical Officer of Health for Nof Norfolk Haldeman County, and Stephanie Pongratz, uh, Director of Public Health in Norfolk Haldeman County, who we will hear from shortly. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron, Wendat, Patoon, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet. We acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Diné, the Soto, and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. You are welcome to introduce yourselves and your affiliation and where you're hailing from in the chat. Um, as we move into the presentations, we ask that you keep your mic muted uh, unless you're going to ask a question. The Q&A uh, will take place in two sessions. Uh, so please hold your questions for then, um, but we'll ensure that there's plenty of time to answer all your questions over the, over the session. Uh, we are recording this session, so if you do not wish to appear in the recording, you can turn off your video if you're asking a question audio uh, by audio, or you can also uh, put your question in the chat, and I will move them into the uh, into the audio presentation. Um, so I'm going to ask Father Peter to please introduce our guests uh, for this session. Take it away, Father. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here again with you. Uh, I just found out that uh, Peggy Congress, the Director of Public Health, was joining us. So most of my remarks, introduction, are to do with Dr. Shanker, that's not the right, but of course it reflects the good work, the exceptional work that is being done by the, by the whole team. Um, I just want you to know that uh, I, Call him affectionately and with respect. Dr. Shankar brings a wealth of experience and international training and expertise from Boston and to his current position on the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. Dr. Shankar began his long and illustrious career in medicine as a resident in Boston when the AIDS epidemic exploded back in the 1980s. His specialty in infectious disease, his care for the patients, educating the public, and advocacy would prepare him well for perhaps one of the biggest challenges he would face in his medical profession. I think he would say so, uh, the COVID pandemic. But before speaking to his current role as medical officer of health for the Norfolk Calderman Health Unit, uh, you should know that Dr. Shanker continues to train medical students and future doctors as a member, as a faculty professor for the Medical Health Sciences at McMaster University in Hamilton. 
one of his areas of specialty has been in rehabil rehabilitative medicine for patients who are recovering from stroke, brain injury, amputation, cancer, and fractures. Now, as the Medical Officer of Health for Haldeman Norfolk uh, Health Unit, Dr. Shankard's his team had to deal with the pandemic crisis, uh, certainly under the most trying circumstances. Lives were on the line. Not only were they diligent in protecting the public at large, but they had to respond to the different crises and outbreaks at the local nursing homes and farms, which impacted hundreds of migrant farm workers. For the purpose of this discussion, you should know that those of us working on the ground here locally as advocates for the migrant workers have come to truly admire and respect the work of the local health unit. Personally, I was with the team when the tragedy befell a Scotland farm back in June of 2020 with the death of Mr. Juan Lopez Chaparro. We visited all five of the installations uh, where the men were living to convey the sad news. Our work went well into the middle of the night as Dr. Shankar answered each and every one of the questions and concerns that the men raised, those who were in quarantine. While the tragic death of one is one too many, I can say with confidence that many lives were spared and many outbreaks contained as the local medical health team went into action. At times though, their efforts have created some controversy and tension, mainly among some of the local growers. You should understand that while the farmers generally do cooperate, there is still much to be done in terms of ed education and prevention when it comes to the COVID health crisis. For example, last year, the Health Review Board sought to overturn the mandatory three workers per bunkhouse policy when the men are in when the workers are in isolation. However, in response to that, many local advocates, churches, and organizations were vocal in their support of this policy. We believe that the policy saved lives and spared many others from being infected with the coronavirus. And in fact, in the end, the uh, the courts ruled in favor. Recently, it was announced that Dr. Shanker will be stepping down in May uh, in his post as the medical health uh, officer. Uh, by then, the vaccines rollout should be well on its way. Well, we would say that there's no one more deserving of a well-earned rest after putting in countless hours and days of dedication and care for the local community. We can say sadly his expertise and ad advocacy will be missed. I look forward to Dr. Schenker's contribution this afternoon and you will come to understand and appreciate how uh, Dr. Schenker is able to take complex medical problems and explain it to us ordinary folks with very little medical background. And so we welcome Dr. Shanker and Peggy to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, um, uh, Father Peter, um, um, thank you for uh, allowing me to a few minutes to speak today. Uh, my colleague, uh, Sarah, uh, Stephanie Pongrantz is here and she's able to also provide some additional questions, answer any additional questions. I repeat myself, so forgive me for that, but um, so COVID, the first is the public health services mission as, as best as we can is to minimize disease transmission uh, in the community, but even its broader mission is to try to advance health, the health of a community as opposed to any specific individual. And that ultimately uh, requires us to balance many competing risks and interests uh, with the hope of trying to achieve the best possible public health outcome. Secondly, uh, the public health unit is focused uh, uh, particularly on people that are disadvantaged or otherwise uh, suffered disproportionately from the burden of illness uh, or diminished health. So we work on, um, uh, we work, uh, on trying to minimize um, 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 uh, the burden of illness overall. And we try to particularly focused on the disadvantaged 
uh, or those people who have historically poor health outcomes. Thirdly, um, this is the first year approximately of the outbreaks in Haldeman Norfolk. And um, we know that COVID-19 is a disease primarily communicated by respiratory droplets. So if someone coughs on someone, sneezes on them, um, they're likely to transmit COVID-19. And we know that the number of cases worldwide has increased over this past year. Once COVID-19 enters a household or a, a residence or a nursing home or a group home or a bunkhouse, it can spread very quickly. And that's even more of a problem this year than last year because these new variants of COVID-19 are thought to be even more infectious than the old variants. Most people who get COVID-19 have mild to moderate respiratory symptoms. They have cough, fever, chills, and most people get better. However, um, a smaller percentage of people, especially the elderly, can succumb to it and ultimately die. And in this health district, approximately 39, 39 people have died uh, of which most were elderly, but uh, a num uh, um, um, of note, uh, of the 39 deaths, 12 were in people who lived in the community. They're not all older people who live in nursing homes. When people arrive from overseas uh, or arrive into Canada, they're supposed to self-isolate for 14 days. And after that period of self-isolation, if they don't have any symptoms, the chances of them having COVID-19 or having it and ultimately having it resolved and not giving to anyone else are diminished. And that's why we have the self-isolation period for 14 days. I wanna share with you that you know, farm workers are, are arriving at the airport testing positive for COVID-19 and we've, felt we've faced that challenge. And one of our goals is not only to provide good clinical care to the people who arrive, uh, who arrive with COVID-19, but also to make sure they don't transmit COVID-19 to other people, be that on the bus, which we see, which we are concerned about, or in the, uh, in the bunkhouse, uh, or in the self-isolation residence, or in the bunkhouse after self-isolation. So we work, we work to try to minimize the transmission of COVID-19. If someone's residing in a hotel, we don't want the, and it's someone who has COVID-19 to transmit COVID-19 to another migrant farm worker, and we don't want them to transmit it to other people in the hotel, that be the guests or workers. And one of the things uh, and we say gently, but it's important is many hotel workers are also at the lower end of the economic spectrum. And many of them are from uh, more modest circumstances and we owe it to them as well as to protect their health and safety as well. And it's, a, it's always that balancing act between these competing interests that we, um, uh, uh, the, that we, try, to, uh, we try to address. Moving forward, what are the things that we can do to help migrant farm workers? So I, I um, hear a few things. One is, and I've spoken to provincial officials yesterday and I've spoken to federal officials. One is, is that we can offer all migrant farm workers vaccination at the time of arrival. It'd be preferred to actually be vaccinated in the home country, but if that's not possible, vaccine at the time of arrival. After two weeks of uh, subsequently, the vaccine is likely to prevent them from getting sick. Number two, direct transport from the airport to their self-isolation residence, because we know that people can infect other people on the bus. The bus trip can be two and three hours. Number three, um, 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 let people isolate alone, preferably, but in small groups, as opposed to isolating in 20 and 30 people. We know that COVID-19 is spread by people sharing bathrooms, kitchens, and uh, um, uh, and bedrooms. So if you have a self-isolation residence and you have 25 people who get off the arrive and one of them gets sick, that could potentially affect 24 other people. And if other people get sick, their quarantine period is also extended. Theoretically, you can have a very long outbreak because you have a lot of people in self-isolation. Number four, if there is an outbreak, uh, number four, make sure these uh, the, these workers have family doctors. We have found that many of them have no family doctors, no access to basic health services. Number five, um, 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 if there is an outbreak to find places to self-isolate people individually so that they can recover individually and also separate those people who are, are infected from those who are not infected. 
And I think if we do those sort of six steps, we can improve the health status of migrant farm workers for this season. Quite honestly, I'm more afraid about this season than last season. Um, uh, and as a public health matter, I think that we wanna to try to do our best to advocate for the best possible public health plan. So, well, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that people might have. Uh, um, and Stephanie is available too to answer any questions that uh, people might have that I am not familiar with or cannot answer. Right. I have a question. Hello. Oh, hi, Anthony. Hi. Uh, yeah, I had a question. So I am the Migrant Worker COVID Response Organizer in Winnipeg, and I am with MANSO, the Manitoba Association Newcomer Serving Organization. And so I'm working on this project uh, to support um, migrant workers funded by ESTC. And um, part of the work right now involves reaching out to um, the community and um, also, um, you know, other um, faith-based groups to um, see the kind of work that's ha happening. And I I'm wondering sort of on your end, what, what kind of resources have been provided to support um, these workers? Um, do you have infographics or, um, you know, pamphlets that you use and could that possibly be shared? So uh, we have a whole variety of educational materials written in many common land home country languages. Um, and those materials talk about uh, the self-isolation period methods and strategies to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. Um, uh, if you were to uh, uh, send me an email, I can, uh, I think we can share the, some, of the, some of the information that we have in our health district. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, sorry, doctor. Uh, it, do you have an email that I could reach you? Sorry. Uh, Father Peter has my email and uh, just send, if you send him an email, he'll make sure it gets to me. Sure. Oh, oh okay. Well, Thank you. Somehow we'll get you the email. Don't worry. Uh, Connie can probably get it to you as well, but we'll get you the email. We'll make it hey, up. Connie. Hi. <laughs> it's been a while, Connie. <laughs> how are you? Yeah, hi. We'll connect after, you know, after the webinar to, yeah. Thanks, Connie. Uh, and we yeah. have a question from uh, yes. T-E-W-N. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, everyone. I, my name is Mich Michelle Toom. I'm an occupational, occupational health nurse with the Occupational Health Clinic for Ontario Workers in Hamilton. And uh, Dr. Schenker, I, I uh, want to thank you not only for all your work with this population over the last years, but um, also for those incredibly excellent five recommendations that you listed out. And I have to say that I share your, your concern about this season as compared to last season. You know, when workers uh, came last season, essentially they weren't coming to disease on farms, but this year they are. Uh, so um, I'm, I, I just was wondering who you shared these recommendations with and whether um, any action on this uh, can be expected. Well, I've shared these recommendations with the federal government and the provincial government. Um, Mr. Massey has been gracious enough to take my phone calls. I've met with federal officials and senior federal advisors. I've written to the prime minister and, to the, and, the, um, um, uh, and that's the, on behalf of the health district um, uh, and to the cabinet ministers responsible uh, six other medical officers of health, uh, including six of six medical officers of health, including the chief medical officer of health for Ontario, have articulated many of these concerns. Um, and yesterday, I was on a phone call with Omafra, which is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and Rural Affairs, and um, the Ministry of Health to to advocate for these items. At this point, the number one thing that we can do to help migrant farm workers from getting sick is to vaccinate them at the airport. And the political calculus is, is that we need, you know, vaccine and who gets vaccine is so emotionally charged. Um, 
but I think that if there's one thing that we can do to help migrant farm workers is to vaccinate them as they arrive at the airport. And if we do that, I think we'll have substantively reduced the risk of them getting sick. A vaccine doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting infected and it doesn't prevent you from transmitting the disease to somebody else. But it is a, a definite uh, opportunity, I think, to effectuate the plan. Um, and it makes good public health sense. This is, you know, the public health service is apolitical. When we think of risk in my district, in our district, Stephanie, in our district, there are approximately 4,500 migrant farm workers who arrive every year and about 250 have been infected. There are 110,000 people in the district overall and about 1,000 250 have been infected. So the risk of a migrant farm worker in Haldeman, Norfolk being infected is many, many times greater than uh, a general member of the community. Now, I, there's a question on the chat about, um, well, will migrant farm workers have to isolate at the airport for three days? Well, that was true for all arriving visitors. And then um, uh, uh, owners of agricultural enterprises were, and farm workers were exempt from that requirement. Apparently that's only, that exemption only lasts till March 14th. And uh, you know, it's been our position that there needs to be more federal action. In fact, our position at the health district is that um, the federal government should manage the self-isolation period for all migrant farm workers and not local health districts and not farmers. For both the resource point of view and also from a fairness and justice point of view, the only people who do not have, uh, uh, who cannot uh, pick where they need to self-isolate are migrant farm workers. Their, their self-isolation plans are dictated by their employer. Um, and, and it's not just migrant farm, people who work at farms, but other seasonal agricultural workers. I think there's a fundamental asymmetry in that policy. And, uh, uh, from my vantage point, uh, and that's we've advocated for this since September. Um, notwithstanding that, there hasn't really been much action on uh, uh, on that item. Uh, I'm sorry for being so long-winded on these uh, responses. Well, that's uh, thank you very much for that. Um, from your perspective, at this point in time, um, is there any action that can be um, expected? You know, did you get any messages about? Um, yes, we will pursue <laughs> vaccinating workers on arrival. Um, your messages are very good, uh, very clear, and with a lot of people. Uh, just wondering if there is any hint of uh, movement on them. Yeah, you know, um, we've been advocating since September. For the most part, we've not had a formal, we have not had a formal response. Um, Okay. I, I remain optimistic we, that you know some action will be taken. The issues are not the public health issues, and I don't think the issues are the recognition of the problem at the level of public health officials. The problems are really about for vaccination. It's really about the political will, and um, uh, and, you know, the public health service advocates in an apolitical manner. We, we just tell what the facts are. Um, why some you know, groups got vaccine and why others didn't is, was modulated in some part by some level of constituency management. And um, this is like a lot of disadvantaged communities. They don't really have uh, a powerful... Uh, um, uh, a powerful enough lobby uh, to effectuate the plan. Now, migrant farm workers are going to be in the next phase of vaccination. But my concern is, is that most of them will already be here by the end of April. And we may have missed a golden opportunity to prevent outbreaks. So time is of the essence uh, uh, from a public health point of view. There's some other issue that's important as well, which is that when, there are not, when there's an outbreak on a, on a farm, and we had one outbreak where we had 220 people infected and 18 went to the hospital and 12 were admitted and seven were admitted to the intensive care unit and two were put on a ventilator and one died. It was just one outbreak. There's that human toll. 
But then there's a toll on the public health service as well, because at one time we had 39 people working on managing the outbreak, which means that that's 39 people not working on vaccination for young people, for children. 39 people not working for maternal fetal care, care for mothers and newborn children. People not working on inspection of restaurants. People not working on inspections of pools and spas, uh, salons. Um, all the other stuff that the public health service does is diverted by these outbreaks. We had an outbreak over the Christmas time and I held, we held the staff, Stephanie and I held the staff all the way through the holidays. So, um, and I, I don't, I don't, I know your time is precious and I want to belabor this point, but in medicine as doctors, there are certain things that money can't fix. If you have pancreatic cancer, we can't fix that. But in this particular case, a small amount of money can keep people safe. Uh, a small amount of money can pe give people, pe people safe. The second issue is, is the science supports it. So that many of the people that we vaccinate now uh, are probably at lower risk from dying from COVID than migrant farm workers. And yet they're ranked higher in the priority list. Um, and so I think from a, 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 um, um, a public health position, I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask that one, thing, one question. Uh, federal government, please vaccinate migrant farm workers at the time that you do the test at the airport. But then, uh, if they were to do that, that would make a huge difference. Um, if they were to say, please transport these people by private car to the farm, that, that would make a huge difference. It wouldn't solve the problem, it would make a huge difference. Both of those are just about political will. It's nothing else. It's not about any, finding a new treatment or investigating the science or anything like that. It's just about allocating resources to it. And um, anyway, I, I don't want to belabor that point, but uh, I think that's really where we're at today. Doctor, if I could just play a little devil's advocate. So let's say you're advocating for a priority vaccination for the migrant worker. Someone might say, well, then you're depriving more seniors or other vulnerable people. Do you see that as necessarily conflicting or, or can the two uh, demands be met simultaneously? Sure, you know, um, um, uh, um, uh, at one level, Father Peter, I have to chuckle that uh, as a priest, uh, you've, you've brought the devil into this, but uh, 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 I think it's still an unanswered theological question if Satan exists, right? So, or the devil exists. Uh, um, the, um, we are back, back, I think the first group of people that should be vaccinated are the very old people over 80. We're already doing that. Then there are a whole group of people who are vaccinated who are at a much lower risk of getting, of dying of COVID. So that would include somebody like maybe a 30 year old doctor in training in, in neurology, or um, uh, perhaps a, 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 a person who works in a, a non-clinical field at the hospital, but right now we're vaccinating all healthcare workers or virtually a, a large proportion of healthcare workers who have a lower risk of succumbing. So I think in the justice framework of allocating a scarce resource, uh, my personal view is, is that workers sit higher on, the, uh, uh, higher on this issue. Now, this goes to a very difficult philosophical position, which is that are some occupations more virtuous than others? So everyone intuitively says, well, we should vaccinate doctors and nurses. Well, doctors for the most part see patients in very controlled circumstances. I was at the farm, there were 200 people at the farm who were infected. We wore a mask and a face shield, we were fine. None of my team got in, none of our team got infected. Doesn't mean we won't. Lower level healthcare workers, people who are paid lower salaries, people who work as personal care attendants, they've been infected. I've seen that. So I think that uh, the justice issues fit squarely uh, um, uh, uh, towards vaccinating migrant farm workers immediately, especially as, as I look through the list of people being vaccinated now. The second issue is a public health policy issue, which is that the consequence of a cluster of people being getting uh, sick, like two or three, 
is relatively easily manageable by the public health unit. It's a couple of calls, a couple of calls over a period of time, but a couple of calls. Um, but when you have an outbreak with 250 people and you have to transfer them to a hotel and manage their self-isolation plans and try to speak to them in a language that they can understand, that's a huge amount of resources that saturates the public health service. So that's another reason. It's just not the risk, but the, um, 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 uh, it's just uh, one more reason why we want to use public health resources while um, I'm just looking at the chat room here. Um, um, yeah, and this is a comment about from Connie about the, the letter that Karos had signed. And then Mr. Pereira said, why do we sound like we're just group transmitting COVID? I think that, um, you know, this meeting is about migrant farm workers, but almost all air travel is associated with risk. And um, that is something that we have to contend with is that air travel is a risky, uh, uh, a, a risk uh, uh, that, we all, uh, th that we all face. Um, and these are the balancing acts. It's, it's just not trying to contain COVID before it, uh, when people arrive, but it's making sure that other migrant farm workers don't get COVID. And if you look at the farm, brought breaks that's one thing we recognize that the people who suffer disproportionately in these outbreaks are the workers themselves because um, they're more likely to get infected if COVID makes its way into a bunkhouse. Um, they have less access to physician and other health resources. You know, uh, I know you know this, but many people don't know that uh, many, many migrant workers can't go to the regular doctor's appointment. They don't have regular doctors. Their, their work schedule does not permit uh, uh, um, 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 it doesn't permit uh, going to the physician during the work period. Um, and and um, so it, uh, it leads, I think, to a whole, a whole group, a group of challenges. But I think to Mr. Pereira's point, um, it, it is the vector of transmission is not only migrant farm workers arriving. Uh, there are other people who are traveling. If you travel on a plane with holiday makers, and other people, those people are also at risk for transmitting COVID um, on the plane. So, um, Mr. Pereira, I, I appreciate your comments and uh, uh, I'm happy. Oh, Mrs. Pereira, Ms. Pereira, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to hear your dialogue on this or answer any other questions. I have to run in about eight minutes or so, but uh, um, um, thank you for, the, for, for that perspective. Thank you. I I would like to, to, to ask a question and maybe to make a comment. I'm Eliseo Martel from Grand River Community Health Center. And we have the vaccination as a measure that probably can control the issue of transmission from this virus. But the other issue is that besides the vaccine, when the workers go to the farm, they don't have practically any access to health services. And to, to think that workers are going to have a family physician is really to be very, very, very unrealistic. Because even the local population, are still many of them are still looking for a family physician. So considering that this is not going to happen, I wonder if there is a way that could create some kind of link between public health, farms, or the workers, and centers like ours or working clinics that can provide that service to the workers. It doesn't matter which day of the week. And so if there is a more coordinated uh, work in regard to clinical services for the workers, maybe that can be more effective and in preventing outbreaks because then one worker can feel free to call and to let the, whoever the physician is there know about symptoms and the physician can do something about it and to prevent a spread of the virus within the farm, I mean, within the farm. So I wonder if that is possible because at this moment, it sounds like uh, one group of people are talking about one thing, the other group is talking about another thing, and the fact that they are not talking to each other debilitates the effort that individual groups uh, do. That, that was one thing. But the, other, the comment, the question that I have is in regard to this, I don't know if this is mandatory, but I have read that People go to quarantine for 10, for 14 days, and they are asked on the day 10 to do a self-test. 
for COVID-19. So my question is, are these workers going to be doing this self-test too in regard to COVID-19 in the host in the in the hotels when they are in quarantine? Is is it mandatory for them? So, Mr. Martel, um, um, uh, the first, the, I think your first point is a very penetrating one. The lack of one agency to provide overall management and supervision and care for these uh, individuals uh, is a deprivation. Um, you know, we have one agency managing all air traffic. We have uh, uh, one agency managing the hydro grid, uh, um, but we have this piecework patchwork system. Secondly, if I had my way, every person in Canada is guaranteed a doctor. And uh, right now, these people don't even have an OHIP card on arrival. Those are simple things the government could do immediately yeah. uh, to give people access. Um, uh, and that's true for all people. You know, equality is such a beautiful concept that if that's what we advocate for, just think what, uh, uh, what we would do for our own children. I would never let my children not have an OHIP card or access to a doctor. So why would I? And um, so I think those are all very fair, fair points. This patchwork system is not working. The second issue about self-testing on day 10, um, that would not be my recommendation as a public health physician. In fact, uh, for the most part, they don't ask our opinion, despite the fact that Norfolk County has the highest concentration of migrant farm workers outside of Windsor, Essex. Um, uh, we don't, uh, the federal officials do not, uh, uh, do not ask for our opinion. Um, the test that they're proposing is a self-administered test, meaning the person supposed to do the test themselves. We still have no idea on how the test, once it's done, would actually get to the lab because the test is only good for a period of time. It has to be refrigerated. Uh, a UPS, we understand that some courier is going to go pick up the test. We're not sure how people with, you know, having, uh, having been involved in the outbreaks, we, uh, it's fair to say that migrant farm workers are of a lower socioeconomic status in their home country with likely lower educational attainment. Um, a self-administered test in the best of circumstances is hard to do. Actually, um, if I had to do a test like that, it would, I would have to spend 20 minutes, a half an hour reading the thing to figure out what to do at what period of time. Let alone coming from another country, being in a bunkhouse, not having access to the internet, reading instructions that were probably not made from your home language. All of that is completely inexplicable to me how this can come about. Secondly, I'm not even sure the test is needed. If you self-isolate for 14 days, we don't release people in Canada based on a test. We only release them if they're a close contact. So if you, uh, the, because it doesn't matter what the test shows. If the test is negative or positive, you stay for your 14 days. That's, that's the end of it. What this test may end up doing is putting people in longer isolation periods for no good reason. So, um, yeah, I'm very concerned about the test. I was not consulted on it. Neither were my colleagues, to my knowledge. Um, um, and it's not a good public health policy. Um, so I'm sorry, Mr. Martel, for going being a little long-winded. I have to leave in five minutes, so I'm happy to answer one more question if I could. And thank you. Thank you. So one more question and then we even want to. What is the protocol uh, this year for migrant workers after quarantine for 14 days um, coming to town? <laughs> oh, you mean going to the, well, yes. from, my from, from my perspective, once they, like for anybody else, you finish your self-isolation period, you should do all the responsible things everyone else does, you know. Minimize your time outside your residence. Only go out for essential tasks. Wear a mask, say two meters away from other people. Don't have uh, uh, dining events with people who are outside your family. If you, uh, uh, you know, I know that's hard for migrant workers, but you know, I would say eat in your room. But otherwise, the restrictions for migrant farm workers after they finish the self-isolation period should be no different than the recommendations we have for anybody else. Yeah, because sometimes they ask and they are afraid sometimes to leave the farm, even if it's, you know, going for a ride uh, on a bicycle. So they are ab afraid that they're going to get caught and then they're going to be in trouble. So 
Yeah. They always they they ask that question because they don't know the protocols uh, when they get here. So um, it will be nice for us to give them a you know an answer that is going to be good yeah. for them. So in our health district, um, you know, I, I tell farmers if people don't have no compelling reason to leave, if you can provide a service to people on campus and they want to take benefit of that, that's great. So. If people have to travel for money exchange and money exchange can be done on the farm and the workers want it, that's fine. I, I think that's okay, but that's their choice. Um, uh, uh, um, but quite honestly, I wouldn't leave that. Like I stay at home. Uh, uh, I, I try to stay at home as much as possible. I don't let my kids leave the house uh, um, uh, to go to the grocery store. Well, it's, it's, because even now, I don't think it's worth the risk. But I think that um, migrant farm workers should not be subject to any greater restrictions because they're migrant farm workers related to leaving their residence. The bunkhouse is their home. Uh, as uh, Now, if I had my, my, my preference as a long-term policy choice is that people have their own, a room with their own kitchen and bathroom, because that's less likely to stop the transmission of COVID and other communicable diseases. Um, and you know, we have to, I think as a culture, we have to think long and hard about the asymmetry of this relationship. You know, that's not a, that's not an immediate public health issue, but it is a longer term issue, which is, you know, um, we have a community of people who live on the residence of their employer. Now there are other people like that, like mining workers and oil workers, but they are relatively highly compensated and they work two weeks on, two weeks off. And, but as a, um, as a philosophical matter, I think that's something that we'd have to think about. Uh, um, um, so um, with that, I, I think Connie, you had one question, if I could answer it briefly, and then I can, if I could be excused. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it's not actually a question, Dr. Shankar, but just really, you know, to say thank you so much for your valuable, you know, uh, presentation, information, and, and, and clarification on issues that many of us sometimes didn't understand. And I just want also to say that, you know, your five recommendations, um, the government or the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is conducting... Um, a, a consultation briefing and it's going to be tomorrow and I'm going to be bringing you know uh, lifting up these five recommendations that you shared with us and presented to uh, the meeting tomorrow and also uh, the call for migrant workers farm workers to be vaccinated when they arrived instead of going of having another COVID testing upon arrival uh, in addition to the seven, the, the COVID testing that they have already, seventy-two hours prior to de departure. So uh, thank you so much, and we hope that you, we could have you in another time in in a longer conversation. Sure. So if the question is a granular question, uh, there's one advocacy that says we need the federal government to give a special <laughs> allocation directly for migrant farm workers on arrival. The reason I say that is because if you don't have the special allocation, you'll get caught in vaccine disputes. We have a special mm -hmm. allocation for indigenous people in our district. And this is a process that should be managed by the federal government at the airport. If, because people will try or the policy choice below, let them do to the local health district. We won't have any fast way of getting to 5,000 people at the health district. So it's at the airport, federal authorities do it. And it's done. And that is the, I think, the best approach. And I would focus on one approach that that is what should be wanted. That's wanted. It's consistent with fairness. It's also consistent with the public health. Uh, 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 it's consistent with proper public health practice. So um, if that's the one thing I would keep harping on. I wouldn't, har I wouldn't focus on cleaning bathrooms and, and, and education. People already know how COVID's transmitted. So, um, uh, um, um, but if you could focus on that, I think that the public health officials, it would resonate with public health officials as well. And that's the message I've given Mr. Massey at the federal, uh, at the federal government. So with that, I thank you so much for thank allowing you. me to speak today. And I wish you all the best. And Father Peter, uh, I know you're a priest and you never do these things for anything but the glory of God, but uh, 
you've been an immense resource to the, to the workers and the people at the health district. And uh, uh, thank you so much for all of your work collectively and for Father Peter is, for your work in the church. Um, thank all the best. You too. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you everyone for allowing me to join the meeting today as well. Take care. All right, Stephanie, thank you, Stephanie. It's so gracious of you to work on your day off for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about what the process looks like currently, and we're going to get into uh, what changes have come um, over 2021. Uh, but just one quick thing I wanted to touch on, there was uh, sort of a more philosophical question in the chat uh, that I think is really valuable in um, moving through what is like a government process. Um, and Christine in the chat, as part of uh, talking about this as a human rights issue uh, asked, do we value migrant workers as much as all other Canadians? Um, and I think um, uh, often as is, there's framing that happens um, as we hear news about this in terms of um, outbreaks or potential outbreaks. Uh, and uh, Falana also said, why does it sound like we are just a group transmitting COVID. Uh, and I think it's so important to um, put this as a people first issue. Um, it should be about the safety of migrant workers and giving respect uh, to migrant workers through this process, um, rather than treating migrant workers as a vector um, in this disease. Um, or in, uh, in the virus, sorry. Um, so I think really putting uh, human rights and safety for migrant workers at the forefront is so important to how we frame a discussion uh, on this topic. So uh, with that, I have- David, can I just yeah. add a comment? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so what I explain to people, sometimes people in my community say, well, Father, you, you were at that farm and you're, you're gonna get catch the disease or whatever. I said, no, 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 no. If I wear PPE, I'm trying to protect the workers because I'm the one out in the community. They're the ones in the vulnerable situation. And that's the way we, we look at it is that they're more in a vulnerable, precarious situation because of the congregate living. So when we talk about protecting, we're not so much saying the migrant workers uh, as transmitting, it's us who are potentially at risk to them because of their living situation. So just, that's what Dr. Shanker was trying to draw our attention. Yeah. Absolutely. And Connie, you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, just, uh, just uh, to say also, you know, that uh, these webinars that we're doing uh, is primarily focused to highlighting the issues that, you know, uh, temporary foreign workers and migrant farm workers are facing uh, to, to inform us, to inform the general public and also to, to, to gather support and understanding because a lot of people might not know uh, where the migrant workers are and how they are faring, especially during this pandemic. And this is a task or this is a work that we've accepted uh, with the funding that is provided to us by uh, the federal government uh, to empower uh, temporary foreign workers during COVID-19. So it's it's not to single out uh, the, the, the migrant workers, but rather to have this space where we can all lift up the issues that you, know, uh, you are facing and how can, and it's, it's a question for us on how can we further support you. Um, right now we are doing this in a more community coordinated approach where we try to have partnerships with local and community organizations, collaborate with each other and be able to, do, to, to develop and deliver you know, uh, uh, a coordinated collaborative approach. So we're not duplicating, we're not competing with each other, but rather complementing, you know, on each other's work and to make sure that we are able to reach out to as many uh, migrant workers as possible. So just to, yeah, uh, to provide that context. Thank you. So I'm just gonna go through the, the process as it 
has been and is shifting to uh, currently, just so we have an idea of the landscape that's going on right now. So um, many parts of the process of coming to Canada as a temporary foreign worker during COVID-19 have remained static since they came into effect last year. Uh, I'll be talking through that process first and then adding in the layers that have been added into the process uh, leading into 2021. Uh, so coming to Canada, the standard protocols for travel during COVID-19 are present in the process for migrant workers. So wearing a mask and not traveling while showing symptoms uh, connected to COVID-19. Uh, as part of their journey, migrant workers are expected to show proof of a negative COVID test to board the plane. Um, they will also need information on where they're working and quarantining, as well as either having the ArriveCan app uh, open an email receipt from ArriveCan or a printout of that receipt, uh, depending on access to a smartphone or not. Uh, they also need a travel plan in place for getting to their accommodations once they've arrived in Canada. Uh, information about their how their essential needs will be met during quarantine, so how they will have access to food, uh, and confirmation that they're not going to be isolated with vulnerable groups, and then their work permit uh, for arriving. Um, I mentioned the Arrive Can app, so there's the flyer for it. Um, so to further elaborate, ArriveCan is an app that facilitates uh, travel into Canada. Uh, this is for everyone coming into Canada, uh, but is also required of temporary foreign workers. Um, so it collects travel information, their quarantine plan, and the COVID-19 symptom self-assessment before travel. Uh, and upon arriving in Canada, it tracks the quarantine process by having the uh, worker confirm that they've arrived at the quarantine site and then for the quarantine period, submitting daily self-assessments. Uh, while the app is the easiest way to use ArriveCan, there are other options available, including desktop computers or phone for people who don't have access to uh, a smartphone or a data plan while in Canada. Uh, although the phone number is a 1-800 number, so there are issues with uh, using SIM cards from other countries potentially. Uh, while the purpose is to ensure that there is a quarantine plan in place, uh, that active symptoms are not present during travel and the 14-day quarantine is followed, the app does not utilize GPS location for this and only uh, collects information given by the user. Um, so it's not a surveillance app per se, it only utilizes information that's put into it. So upon arriving into Canada, uh, workers will follow their travel plans to head to their quarantine accommodations where they will stay in their residences uh, and practice physical distancing for the 14 day period. Members of the same family arriving together can quarantine together. Uh, if someone new arrives in the accommodation, a new quarantine period has to start. Uh, so newly quarantining workers or those not in quarantine should not be housed in the same facility as the quarantiners. Um, we heard a bit more about that process from Dr. Shanker and we can discuss it further after this as well. Uh, after the quarantine period, as Dr. Shanker said, they can begin working normally and uh, begin um, they're free to leave the facilities in which they're living. Um, the recommendation is that this follows the guidelines, uh, the safety guidelines of the province. So saving it for essential trips, uh, continuing social distancing and mask wearing, um, and following uh, lockdown procedures if those are in place. Uh, so there have been some changes in the process in 2021. Um, as Francine mentioned in the first webinar, um, there are some complications due to availability of tests in certain uh, countries that would be sending uh, workers to Canada, um, specifically the Caribbean. Uh, 
Um, there are also many costs associated with getting tested pre-travel when there are tests available as well. Uh, further to this, if a positive test comes back uh, in your home country, uh, there would be additional costs to either travel back home, retest, or quarantine and reschedule traveling in place. So um, these are some of the issues that are being sorted out currently. Um, and due to commercial flights to and from Mexico uh, and the Caribbean being suspended, chartered flights are flying migrant workers to Canada, but only to four cities currently, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Montreal. I believe they can connect to local flights from these four main cities and begin the quarantine process when they arrive in the locality where they'll be working. Because of the cost and costs and availability issues for testing, there is some, te some debate about testing both pre-air and upon arrival in Canada. The current process remains in place for the safety of the workers, though, uh, in line with what we know about the gestation of the virus. Currently, a COVID-19 molecular test is taken upon arrival and a second test kit with instructions is given to all workers to do a test later in their quarantine to assure the worker and employer that the worker is safe to begin the season. Uh, as Dr. Shanker mentioned, there are some issues with how those second tests are going to be collected, but we can also continue to discuss that afterwards. The requirement that those arriving in Canada wait in government approved accommodations while they wait for the results of the arrival test has been deferred for migrant workers until the 14th of March. Uh, as they work out a tailored solution specific to temporary foreign workers because of the amount of temporary foreign workers coming through. Uh, there's some debate about whether hotel quarantining is. Um, is feasible uh, or what the government is going to be responsible for in that process. So we're still waiting to see where we go with that. Um, but we, that, that is in development. So hopefully we will hear something quite soon. Uh, post quarantine period, workers must be allowed freedom of movement uh, while respecting the safety measures in place. They're encouraged to stay home as much as possible as we all are. Um, and avoid gathering in large groups, but are absolutely allowed to leave the property of the facility to purchase essential goods or to get out and exercise or for self care. So that is the state of things as it's supposed to be. Uh, I'm interested to hear from uh, partners if they have had different experiences with this or if people have questions about sort of the state of things as they are. Uh, so you're free to ask questions. You can put questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand with the reaction button. Um, and I see some questions and answers are already going on in the chat. So I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, yep. Debbie, Debbie, the question that I have is in regard to this Day, uh, day 10th quarantine self-test because listening to Dr. Shankar, it seems that it's not public health asking for it. So then if it is not public health, who is asking for it? Who is making it mandatory? Who is supervising it? Who is monitoring it? If the test is negative or positive, what happened with the worker? And the reason I'm asking is because some farmers and also some people working with farms are, are worrying about these measures. So, but when I'm listening to Dr. Shankar, it seems that in some places it's going to be mandatory depending on, I don't know what, and in other places it's like it doesn't exist. So do you have more information about that? I am wondering about that as well. That was listed in, uh, as part of, um, I believe, through the Service Canada site. Um, but I'm, uh, like, I'm not clear sort of of the infrastructure that's holding it up. Uh, Connie, did you want to respond to that? And uh, we will get to your question next, uh, Felina. 
Um, thank you so much, Nisea, for raising that question, because now I kind of share your question as well. Uh, after hearing from Dr. Shankar and clearly stating that, uh, you know, these policies are coming out without direct consultation with public health. And for those who are, you know, really uh, health practitioners and directly on the ground. So um, I will be bringing that up, you know, to this consultation that I was talking about earlier. It's happening tomorrow. And, and I also wanted to say that, you know, for this webinar, we actually invited Service Canada uh, to, to join and be able to speak particularly on these new guidelines or, yeah, the guidelines and uh, these additional measures and so forth. But I think, as uh, again, uh, Dr. Shankar said, uh, there's, there are no clear plans uh, put in place yet on how to go about this, you know, the new measures or additional measures. And I think, um, yeah, uh, the issues and recommendations and kind of solutions that Dr. Shankar, you know, presented to us is now becoming very clear in terms of the lack of coherence, you know, particularly both at the federal, provincial, and even community level with regards to uh, public health uh, implementation of this and making sure that, you know, it's not just the migrant workers that we're worried about, but the overall management of, of, of the virus uh, for all of us. So, yeah, uh, I, will, I will definitely bring, bring this up. Thank you. You can go ahead, uh, Felina. Hi, good Hi. afternoon. My name is Felina Pereira and I'm a migrant farm worker here in Simcoe. And my question is on, based on David's last comment as farm workers, is it when farm workers are out of quarantine, after the 14 day quarantine, we are allowed to walk freely or go to the grocery stores or is it you talk about, um, well, no, with this with this year quarantine after for 14 days, we are, we have to stay in the hotel accommodations, but we're not allowed to come outside unless there's a balcony. So I was wondering that that comment you made, was it, is it specific to after quarantine or within quarantine? Because last year I remember being in quarantine and the, the bunk houses or the accommodations were flagged or they had ropes outside that you couldn't walk over. So that's that's my question today. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure on I some of it is I believe like farm to farm in terms of the quarantine period in terms of uh, being able to leave the facilities. I think it's dependent on the kind of facilities that they're being housed in during that process. Um, but certainly after the quarantine period is over, there is uh, yeah. there is a sort of more complete freedom um, in that. But uh, I was reading an article about um, the sort of strictness of hotel quarantine stays and not being able to leave the room. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if that's standard across the quarantine experience. Um, no, I think it's just in Norfolk, Kalimantan County. Yeah, so I wonder about the sort of- um, I, Can I say something, David? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when, I, when I was dealing with the workers in Brantford, uh, they were also restricted to their rooms as well. The I did have a little bit of conversation with Dr. Shanker, and the the remember the other thing we have to remember when you're in quarantine, you're not just protecting the workers; you have to protect the staff. Mm -hmm. So they also have to be protected. And some hotels, I don't, I can't comment on all facilities. I know that in Brantford, they're basically restricted to their rooms, and in fact, they restrict them even to a particular wing. And that's for, for both protection of the staff and the workers. When my mother was in quarantine, 
during an outbreak, she couldn't leave her room for 35 days. Now, I know she was an elderly woman, but uh, I, I, my point is, is that quarantine is quarantine, whether you're a migrant worker, resident, Canadian, you know, we're dealing with a very highly infectious disease and we're just trying to, you know, make the environment safe for everybody. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, I, I do see the point of the policy, you know, trying to safeguard everyone. But like David said, once the mandatory 14 days, once the workers out of quarantine, yeah. They, and there's an actual document called freedom of movement that the workers should have the ability facility to go about and do their, his or her, uh, you know, shopping and other errands like any other circumstance, like Dr. Shanker said, wearing a mask and just, you know, social distancing and so forth. So that's what I, my comment to that. Any further comments from I also just want, would like to add that, yeah, the 14-day the quarantine is a 14-day quarantine. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in Ontario. And I think I would like invi to invite Anthony from Manitoba, from Winnipeg, to share how that is being, you know, implemented as well in, in, in other provinces. Um, also... Uh, to say that as Father Peter mentioned, after the 14 day quarantine, you have the right to mobility. And there is a federal letter, you know, clarifying that, that, you know, workers, you have the right to be able to go out and buy your groceries and, and send money and so forth. But recognizing that, you know, uh, each and everyone, you are in a tied employer and each and everyone, each farmer would have their own uh, kind of regulation and protocols. And, and you, you have the, 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 the choice, you know, how to go about it. Um, in the Kairos website, under the Migrant Justice, you know, webpage, there is a number and number there and community partners and contacts that if you need help, if you need assistance or you have questions, you can refer to, you can, you know, call these community partners that is in your location and, and share, you know, what, what are your barriers, what are your issues and how can they support you? There is also a tip line that, you know, uh, the government has provided and, and, you are encouraged to use that. And if you are feeling that, you know, it's putting yourself at risk, you can ask any of the community partners to make that call on your behalf. So it's not you making the call, it's not your personal information that is being shared, but, you know, another party. And we are supported by the Canadian government to, to do this. So just, yeah, that those uh, services and support, um, it's available and you can visit our website to connect with partners on the ground. Uh, yes, Anthony. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Connie, uh, can you um, repeat the question again? Sorry, I, or uh, what? Uh... Uh, she was wondering about the uh, the quarantining in uh, the quarantine period and whether uh, it was a complete isolation in one room or if there were other sort of ways that that was happening uh, in Manitoba. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, based on the Manitoba COVID-19 protocol here, I think the same regulations applies elsewhere. Um, so for people who are coming out of province or um, Canada, they're expected to be in quarantine for 14 days. And um, with uh, respect to, um, you know, safety, um, health regulations, um, people are mandated to, you know, wear masks in stores, um, 
and um, we are advised to um, lower our um, social interactions um, outdoors um, unless people are from the same bubble. Um, and so, yeah, the, the measures here are pretty strict and um, yeah, there already have been cases of people like in the past month um, receiving um, like over a hundred tickets in Winnipeg. So, so the, the fines are pretty heavy and, you know, there, I think um, Manitoba at one point had the highest cases of COVID per capita. I think you probably heard that. And the outbreak started in Brandon um, among um, Maple Leaf uh, workers um, who are, you know, mainly migrant workers. And so, you know, with with that said, I think there's has been some proactive measures taking place, but I'm not sure if you read, but the government of Manitoba recently published um, a report just uh, this Monday that said um, BIPOC, so Black Indigenous people of color, are disproportionately affected by um, COVID-19 here in Manitoba. And what was interesting was that among the BIPOCs, Filipinos were the highest um, uh, to, um, groups to be uh, um, at risk for COVID. So again, you know, people are, you know, saying, oh, community spread, but in reality, what's happening is that the transmission is coming from the workplace and there isn't, you know, support for these workers. Yeah, and that's been sort of true across North America um, through the pandemic is that it's the, that um, safety precautions have to meet with uh, policy. And hopefully we're like through the continued discussions with Service Canada, we can work uh, towards um, having those mandates um, sort of extend through the through the industry for the safety of the workers. Um, and uh, Lennox was asking about whether there's a way to track um, whether farms are keeping with the three workers to bunk houses. Um, and I would dare say probably, <laughs> probably not. Um, and I think part of the uh, Service Canada is um, part of doing more inspections on farms. And I think, um, I think data collection kind of needs to be an important part of that process, but maybe that's just me. Um, and yeah, I think we need more information um, and that's across a great many social issues in Canada, uh, but especially in terms of migrant workers, like we know numbers coming into the country quite often, but I think sort of expanding out what information we have um, will help um, better assess what we can do to make um, the work more safe uh, for, for the workers as years progress. Um, I like uh, Christine, uh, Christine's suggestion to uh, contact MPs and MPPs about um, demanding it, uh, vaccinations for migrant workers. I think that's an important step in the process, um, but these things take time. Um, all right, just looking for any other questions, and if anybody wants to put up their hand, let me know or I think I heard someone. <laughs> uh, David, there was a question about the workers per bunk houses. And that, that was one of the <clears throat> controversies, unfortunately, Norfolk Haldeman Health Unit had to deal with. And uh, although uh, I'll just say it very bluntly, it's a cost factor. 
okay? So the, the, the math is very simple. The more people you have in the bunkhouses or quarantine, and if one of them is, is infected, that means more exposure to the, to the, to the virus. So it, it, the bunkhouses, I don't, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but they are, yes, divided in compartments, but the showers and the bathrooms are shared. And that's the point. That was the issue. So these are not self-contained little apartments with their own bathrooms. So the workers, mostly men, have to share the same washroom and the same shower facility. So taking that into consideration, that's why when there is a mandatory isolation, there is a need for no more than three per bunkhouse, even though these bunkhouses, and, and Dr. Shank was sort of hinting at it, long-term, these bunkhouses have to be reconsidered. They're, they're just not humane. When you're talking about 30, 40 or more people living in a shared space, it's clear that COVID has, you know, exposed some of the, the weakness in the, in the living conditions that these workers face. But anyhow, so that, that was the controversy. But many of us advocates, organizations, churches were strongly in favor. And at the end of the day, the, the courts ruled very strongly in favor of that, said, no, that's, that's right. The three people per bunkhouse makes sense. And, and so the health unit's position held out, even though there were strong, strong objections from some of the local growers. People have to understand that in Norfolk, they are a very powerful lobby. Uh, so sometimes, you know, they can be very vocal. And the health review board is made up of predominantly politicians. So they're always going to be placating their constituents. Uh, so that, that was sort of the uh, controversy and issue that was going on, at least in Norfolk. Yes, I just wanted to uh, ask, have people thought of modular homes as a cost-effective uh, way of providing accommodation rather than the bunkhouses? A modular home would have its own kitchenette and toilet. You know, this is uh, what they were doing for homeless shelters. They were considering that. Would that be an option? It could be an option, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, like from po point of view of the local growers, you're, you're talking about some of these farms uh, employ 200 to 400 or more workers. So uh, that's why I'm, I, I think Dr. Shanker's point was valid that uh, it, it's tough. And I can understand for the individual farmers too that they have to now, how do you provide all this? How do you do all this? And so the point that Dr. Shanker was saying was, it, you know, the government has to take more ownership of this and, and not just, you know, leave it up to the local farmers, health agencies to uh, supervise all this. Because it is, it, it is pretty onerous, you know. Not that they all arrive at the same time, but you're still dealing with large cohorts. And, uh, and like in a place like Simcoe, there's only so many hotels you can find. <laughs> so there's all these, these challenges, you know. But yeah, modular homes or even smaller trailer homes that are more self-contained. I think not only for, for quarantine, I think down the road, this is the, a better way to go for the overall health of the workers and their living conditions. There was an episode of uh, TVO's Political Blind Date uh, that was uh, dealing with the migrant workers issue. Um, and one of the farmers uh, was showing the, the shelter that was being built um, with rooms for two people with their own uh, like safe storage um, and one bathroom for the two people. Um, and I believe one of the people brought up like how quickly is it that these could be built to be a response to the pandemic uh, and that kind of sat in the air uh, because there is, 
it's difficult because we don't already have the infrastructure. Um, but I think something like modular homes or something that can be set up quickly would be good. But even then, you know, we're the the workers are already starting to come in. So I think the solutions are going to have to be <laughs> faster than uh, the ideal solutions can be. But it's it's difficult to gauge sort of where um, where to put priority um, when the issue is so big and so impending. Uh, yeah, Fanny. It has been my experience for um, 14 years working with uh, UFCW. Um, and it's taking a pandemic to, to uh, improve a little bit the housing conditions for uh, migrant workers. Um, it is a dream and it could be, I mean, it will be a dream if, if that happens where a migrant worker can have their own bathroom. Uh, but uh, is it going to happen? I mean, it's taking a long time. And we, we, I've seen awful housing conditions. Um, so, and it's taking this long and a pandemic and a virus to, to improve just a little bit for farmers to build a little bit, some houses to accommodate. But I think once the pandemic is gone, they are going to go back to the same housing conditions because uh, I think the the lobbying, the agricultural um, uh, lobbying in in this area is really is is very strong, very strong. So I think politicians listen more to the farmers than the voice of the workers, and and that's reality. Right, Elena. <laughs> And I also remember the following for Fanny was saying that workers don't vote. So politically speaking, they don't have weight. So if a politician has to choose between a worker and a farmer, he will go for the farmer because that's where the vote is. And that's the one who can create some political damage to this person. So here we are dealing with a reality that is huge and very complex. And so, and, and I think that what Fanny was saying is probably something that we have to keep in mind, but at the same time to see how can we prevent that to happen? Is that the things once the, the pandemic is over, that things don't go back to where they were, the way they were before. Otherwise, these things will be just a happy memory in five years. And we can't let that happen. And another thing is to keep the noise, to to bring it to the public, bring it to the newspapers, not be quiet, because that's that's once it's out there in the public, then people know. Like when I came, uh, when I was working with migrant workers, the only way I knew about their conditions was because I was doing a census. And I thought, I can't believe it. I can't believe we are in Canada. When workers came to me, they couldn't have an aspirin. They couldn't go to the doctor. They couldn't have transportation. Some workers were deported, repatriated because they were sick. And, and that's how I got involved. It's like, so the more groups that join us and the more people that are out there fighting for workers, uh, the more people are, are going to realize, yeah, this is real because migrant workers are invisible. Let's face it. They are invisible. They, people don't recognize them. So, so we have to keep fighting for them. Absolutely. Connie? Um, thank you so much, Jose and Fanny. I know, you know, for us, this is a, a very kind of personal and also passionate, you know, thing that we do. And we recognize that, you know, uh, this problem has been going on for a long time. 
And uh, it is during this pandemic that, you know, uh, it gets more highlighted. Mm -hmm. However, we also know that, you know, uh, we, 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 we recognize that there are good farmers and, and we want to lift up, you know, those good farmers so that they become sort of a model among their peers on how uh, to, uh, to benefit from uh, the workers' labor, but at the same time respecting, respectful of their human rights, respectful of, you know, their rights as uh, workers in Canada, and, and um, the awareness that we are doing now is kind of, you know, widening that circle of informed uh, Canadians and informed farmers and employers. And I actually would like to let you know that we have a farmer with us in, in the webinar. And I would like, you know, to invite him to, uh, to share his perspective uh, um, as he was listening to the presentation and also to our exchanges. Uh, Morris? Sure. Hi. Um, thank you for having me on the call, everyone. And um, I'll introduce myself a little bit, and then um, I can give you uh, some of my uh, recent experience. I have workers quarantining on my farm. They just took the 10-day test, and I'm very hopeful that I'll get a, a, a pause, a, a all negative test back shortly. So uh, my name is Morris Gervais. I uh, own and operate a farm called Barry Hill Farms, uh, just outside of Barry, Ontario. Um, my family's been hiring migrant farm workers from Mexico since 1989. Um, and I guess the reason I'm on this call is because <clears throat> perhaps I'm kind of uh, an endangered species, or you might say a unicorn or something. Uh, I'm a farmer, but I'm also passionate about uh, human rights and, and social uh, justice issues. Um, I come from a Catholic Christian heritage where I had two uncles that were priests. One was a missionary priest that served in the Philippines for many years, who I actually visited in the missions, and another, uh, another uncle who was a bishop. So I come from the Catholic faith community, and I'm a farmer. And so I believe that some of the best foreign aid that this country does is the Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program, because through this program, my farm has offered not a handout, but a hand up to workers in Mexico who have, I, I know the stories, we can't get into this right now, who have actually been able to really better their lives back home and continue to do so. So um, I believe in this program. And I believe that um, if there are farmers that are not being fair and just farmers, and those farmers need to leave the program. And we as Canadians need to do as we always do, as Canadians take the high road. And so I think that's for the most part what this program is. And I think that's what it needs to continue to be because it's a valuable program. Um, Dr. Shanker mentioned that really this is about the philosophy of migrant workers in this country. Yeah, and I believe it is. The struggle that we as farmers face is this. In the marketplace, if I must pay, so let's say double, let's say $28 per hour for migrant work, I cannot compete against imported food coming into this country and stay alive. Okay, so I, I can't do it. So, but in essence, the solution to many issues is vote with your food dollars. Choose Ontario food. Don't choose imported strawberries coming from all other parts of the world. So those are the solutions because politically, it's kind of complicated. So that's, that's how I see this program. I see it as a valuable program. And, and, and you know what? I am in a precarious situation. My business is in a precarious situation, okay? In terms of competition from imported foods coming in cheaper and undercutting my product. And if I don't get my workers, I don't even know that I'm gonna open my farm this year, okay? So food production 
in Ontario is in a precarious situation because of this. So you're right, it's complicated. There's lots that we can do to improve, okay? But it's just like, I, I can't see it ever being feasible to house, like I, I, I employ, I'm a, perhaps a medium sized farm. I employ, I had housing for 42 guys pre COVID. I need 42 workers to harvest the crops on my farm. I can't see the economics of having a private suite for every worker. It's just not going to work. I mean, we have to get through this COVID thing, but I just can't see that working because I can't see other jurisdictions across the world doing that. So, so we gotta, it's gonna be tricky to make these, to solve these things. In terms of the short term, um, I've got experience with the Arrive Can app. My seven workers who are quarantining, they had all kinds of trouble. Uh, they weren't able to, uh, first of all, they tried, they have internet access, but the system wasn't really, they were having trouble. It was, it was in Spanish, but they couldn't actually log on. So they just gave up. So we've, they can't get in and they've given up and they have got so many days behind that they couldn't do it. So the app was in Spanish, but it wasn't working. They were having all kinds of trouble logging in. And then really I can't go into the bunkhouse to help them. Right. I can put the internet access is provided. They know they're supposed to do it. We talk through the window but we can't, uh, we couldn't get it done. Then they'd phone in the 1-800 number and that 1-800 number was in, uh, was in English or French only. <laughs> so they, they, so the Arrive Can is a big, is a big bit of a mess. Um, with the Switch Health update, uh, Switch Health test on day 10, uh, that was crazy. I spent the whole day on Saturday trying to get a hold of Switch Health. Um, I set up a internet connection because actually they're supposed to have an internet connection and they're supposed, the nurse is supposed to come online and witness the guy putting the swab up his nose uh, to start. Um, but once I got on the internet connection, for, first of all, the nurse didn't speak Spanish. Switch Health does had no clue what they were getting into when they signed this government contract. They had no idea that they'd have to do 10,000 workers and they'd need uh, workers to speak, uh, nurses to speak Spanish for 10,000 people. So because the workers at my farm were on one of the first flights that came in that they gave uh, these tests to, um, I was able to get a hold of Switch Health on the telephone and they were kind enough. I guess I just got lucky. They were kind enough to have uh, a kind lady by the name of Daniela. Um, she spoke Spanish. She came on and it took her about an hour and she talked the seven guys through doing the test over the telephone. OK, so same thing. I had this little area set up. There's a porch outside the house where they're quarantining and and. I looked through the window and I stayed away in my distance. And then she handed me the thing, the, 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 uh, the workers uh, put the, the bags that the tests were in into her fridge. And then Purolator came yesterday and, uh, and picked them up. And I'm just kind of on pins and needles here waiting to see if they will all test negative. Hopefully, yes, but it was interesting. Uh, Dr. Shanker said today that even if, perhaps even if they test positive, they're not contagious. And I mean, who knows? That's the crazy thing. It's just, this whole thing is, I, I had someone the other day describe it to me, is it's as if we're flying this airplane and we're building it as we're flying. You know, it's this has been so, so difficult to try to negotiate through. So, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I believe in, in social justice. Yes, I believe in doing the right thing. Yes, there are loads and loads of ethical farmers out there. And the farmers that I know, these workers uh, are like family to, to me, to them. And uh, so, I mean, but it's good. It, I, I think, I don't believe that the word precarious describes the workers that come to my farm because it's their career. And I can tell you lots of stories about how they better their life 
back in their home countries. So, you know, yes, we need to be concerned about the safety of the workers. And yeah, absolutely. I, I want them to get vaccines. But you know what? How about how about the safety of the farmers that are bringing these guys on to their farm? I didn't hear that spoken of once today. Yes, we need to be as a team. Yes, there needs to be equity and justice. But we as farmers in Ontario are simply trying to make a living doing good and noble work of growing fresh fruits and vegetables. And I'm trying my best, but for me, if I have to live through too many more seasons like this, I, I, I don't know if I want to offer, I don't want, I'm the second generation here. I don't know if, I don't know if this is a lifestyle I want to pass on to my kids, the third generation. If it's this difficult every year, we got, we got to, got to get through it somehow. Yeah. And we got to think about it in justice terms, but in food security terms for our country, for the country yeah. of Canada. So, uh, so, well, you know, in, in terms of this project, uh, what are farmers going to need help with? What are workers going to need help with? Well, perhaps stick handling through the quarantine process. Mm -hmm. um, my next workers that come, I think I'm going to have to have them in hotels. I didn't think of that. I didn't think of this risk because it's, it's, it's evolving and changing so rapidly. Uh, last year when the workers came, they, 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 they quarantined in their bunkhouse with with less lesser capacity so no bunk beds and there was space and we gave them ppe and cleaning supplies and told them to wear masks and stay apart in the house and so that's how we did it so i was going to do the same this year but but all this testing and everything's coming along so it's changing we're it's changing as we're flying the airplane so i think that's what i'm going to need to do is put workers into hotels and so therefore, man, that's a lonely, that's like a 14 day jail sentence. And yeah. so how can we help them get through that? And how can, but perhaps how can Kairos help the farmers negotiate through this? Because I don't have a dedicated person to do this. And pretty soon the snow's going to melt and I'm going to have work to do over and above this. So it's going to become challenging for all involved to keep everyone safe. The yeah. workers, the farmers, and my kids living on the same property. Yeah, and I think thank you so much for your insight. Um, it's it's good to hear the farmer's perspective as well. Like that, it has such a cross cutting effect on uh, everyone involved in the industry. So thank you for your candor and uh, sharing that. Um, yeah, it's there's such a fine balance that needs to be struck uh, in terms of. Um, the safety of everyone involved um, and finding a way to prioritize creating safe work environments from the top down um, and bottom up, like sort of a multi-directional approach to ensuring that um, work is being done safely and that uh, farmers are being supported in uh, continuing this program that has been uh, so important to so many workers and farmers as well, um, and protecting our national food security as well. So thank you so much. There's <laughs> there's quite a bit in uh, what you've shared with, with us. So thank you. Um, as an outpouring of that, do we have any sort of further questions in the chat or uh, from those gathered here. Um, and yes, Leo, thank you for your perspective, Mr. Gervais. Well, yeah, I, I'm. Thank you. I'm. I'm glad to be here. I'm just kind of typing a little private message back, but. I mean, I, I don't think there's sides in this. I don't think, yeah. and it's not us versus them. It, it truly isn't. Um, there was a, a farmer near me that I transferred workers to, and he wasn't treating his workers right. And I felt terrible about it. I went to bat for him and actually he's, he's no longer in the program. So that's good. So that's good. So that's, that's what we have to have. But, you know, 
it's interesting, Dr. Shanker's when when the when his announcement came out last year that three workers per bunkhouse. It's interesting. I, my idea about it has changed a little because we know a little bit more now about about the uh, how contagious this truly is, which maybe we didn't know a year ago. But but also it's 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 a difficulty in a one size fits all. I know that there may, may be some workers with older accommodations in in that area that. Uh, you know, probably didn't have adequate spacing, but I also know that, and I've seen some really big, beautiful bunk houses with central recreation rooms and one kitchen for five people, which previous to COVID worked perfectly fine, right? So, so now we've got these issues of, of okay, so what? Perhaps we need, we need our own sink and bathroom and eating facilities during the quarantine period, but then can congregate living take place? As if they were a family bubble once they have um, once they have exited the 14-day quarantine, and then it's going to become an economic consideration for farmers: is how many tiny groups of housing can you have? Because as a farmer, that's going to reduce my risk. I have four bunk houses, uh, COVID-approved last year. One was for four, six. 16 and seven so those were the ones they had previously much higher limits but now i'm looking at it and then well that's not even safe to quarantine these guys anymore so once again it's all just changing and then economically how much can i invest in bunk houses to spread that out and is there enough profit in the business keep in mind and of course man we can't be vilified as farmers for making a profit it's a risky, risky business. And unfortunately, unless my farm can make a boatload of money one year, like almost double what I need, then next year when I get a hailstorm, or I've been through it, one hailstorm, boom, you're done. There's nothing you can do. And so as a good manager, to be able to keep employing all the people that I do, I mean, I got I got 40 families in Mexico counting on me to give them work. And if I close this farm, there's 40 families in Mexico without work. So I'm not a greedy man. Most farmers love what they do, but it's risky business. We have hugely capital intensive businesses, land and irrigation supplies. So it's it's unfortunate. I wish I could do it on, you know, hopes and dreams and fresh air and sunshine. But unfortunately, it's it's a money business. That's that's I don't know. So so if 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 the profit margins become too tight, then farmer and and, and I think you're going to start to see farmers exiting after this year, anyways. Um, I knew last year some asparagus farmers that decided to just take the season off in Norfolk. <laughs> If they were in their 60s and approaching retirement, they thought it's too complicated. I just won't grow my asparagus this year. But some people can't. But, you know, I think you're going to see a turn away from fruits and vegetables and just grow to go to commodity corn and soybeans in the future. Because all you need to do is have a, a combine and a tractor and you don't need this massive uh, human resource requirement. So, you know, anyway, so that's where it is. And so I think farmers would would appreciate some help if you have volunteers on the ground to to help with this. Fantastic ideas to get a to get a family doctor. If you got a family doctor in the area that will sign up to to take them or if there's a clinic that will agree to see them. And man, we as farmers would would welcome any assistance that that this group can can provide. Thank you for that. In sort of your response there, you were also speaking to what uh, Michelle had asked about in terms of uh, some resources you think are needed from farmers. Um, there are a few government programs, specifically uh, financial support in terms of uh, quarantining, uh, like financial supports from the government to fund uh, paying quarantining workers. Um, but I'm sort of curious what other programming is available from the government for farmers. So that's something that I think is worth looking into. And I think as is sort of being evidenced in the chat, like buying local and 
uh, really taking to heart that uh, Ontario grown produce um, and foods overall uh, are uh, beneficial not only to the farmers, but I think it uh, is so important to the entire economic system of uh, the province and country um, to really consider how you're voting with your dollars. Well, yeah, and you know what? It's I think it's in, I mean, that's the industry that I'm familiar with, so I see it in, in food, right? But it's everything. I mean, it's every product we buy. And that's one of the good things of the pandemic. People are beginning to support local in everything. But what it's going to require, if I want to buy, my wife tries to buy clothes made in Canada. It's hard to find. Well, if you can find it, then put the, 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 to me, the fastest way to achieve change, someone will follow the money somewhere, somehow, right? So if, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? I see a lady uh, knitting there on the thing. Make some, Cana make some Canadian made clothes and we'll buy them and then we'll keep this all together and we'll support each other. It's starting to happen throughout the pandemic. Yeah. It truly is. And, and maybe there will be, um, you know, an appreciation, more of an appreciation all, throughout the whole economy, but certainly uh, with food. Connie, you have your hand. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Morris, for sharing your perspective. And we welcome, you know, uh, to hear more from farmers like you to balance the conversation and uh, uh, to really ensure that, um, you know, when we raise issues about situation of workers and their vulnerability, we talk about uh, farmers who are not like you. <laughs> so uh, as one of you know, uh, the participants said, we need more farmers and bosses like you uh, to ensure that there's justice, there's equity, and the workers' rights are kind of promoted and protected. Um, I just also want to announce that this project that we have now in Ontario uh, the project that Kairos is implementing or doing uh, that covers Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI is also happening in other you know, provinces in Canada. So for example, we have Anthony with us from Winnipeg, and he is with Mansu, the, you know, uh, uh, the provincial organization in Winnipeg, and there's also AMSA in uh, Alberta, and Saskatchewan and the Catholic uh, uh, CCIS, um, the Calgary Catholic Immigration Services. And in Quebec, we have, there is another organization that is supported by Service Canada to uh, not to provide emergency assistance and so forth, but also to support, you know, uh, temporary foreign workers during COVID. And this is Immigrant Quebec. Uh, so if you, folks know, uh, friends, uh, you know, contacts uh, with migrant workers in those areas, in those provinces, please have them, you know, connected uh, to the organizations that I mentioned. We would post more information as well about them on the Kairos website. So there's more, you know, kind of collaboration, sharing information, and that uh, workers in other areas and other provinces that are facing difficulties, barriers, and so forth can still be supported by these other organizations. So I just wanted to share that. And I guess we're also nearing the time, David. Eh? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as we're winding down, I just wanted to remind everybody, or I wanted to thank everybody for attending the second uh, webinar in the series. Um, this has been very fruitful in terms of discussion. I've learned quite a bit uh, and I'm excited to learn more. <laughs> uh, the third webinar in the series is gonna be about mental health of temporary foreign workers uh, and strategies for um, provision on one side and also um, uh, tactics uh, and tips 
for workers themselves. Uh, that's going to be taking place on March 23rd, uh, and I've included a link to uh, the next webinar in the chat. Uh, and if you wanted to save the chat, it's not the file button, it's the three little dots next to it. If you have the chat open, then you can click on save chat there. Um, for if you wanted to save the resources. And a video of this uh, webinar will be made available on the Kairos website under resources in webinars and documents. And I believe there will be a way to connect to it through the Migrant Worker Project as well. So uh, unless there are any further questions from people, um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and we appreciate all of your insights. Thank you. And thank you for Father Peter for co facilitating this week. I just posted Dr. Shaker's email, so it's posted. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and see you all at the next webinar. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>